Hello, hello, and welcome to a Destiny thing. Well, hold on, before you click off, it's really more of a game design thing, using a recent event in Destiny 2 as a case study, so don't run away if you're not into Destiny. Being familiar with Destiny, or even caring about it, is not at all required. General gaming knowledge is quite enough for this one. Destiny 2 recently had an issue where the odds of getting specific roles on gear were not as even as they should have been. It was very easy for the community to jump at the chance to assume malicious intent, but Bungie's explanation of what actually happened is much more interesting. Besides, they learned not to try pulling one over on the community way back at launch with experience throttling. No, this was fundamentally a math and programming problem, but I'm going to do my very best to make it easy to understand without needing to be super familiar with anything involved. Before I get right into it, I want to give a quick shout out to my members, currently on screen. These folks go above and beyond to support the channel, and I'm very grateful to them. Being a member is never required, but always appreciated. Thank you. So, video games. Nearly all games, no matter what they are, are not purely deterministic. There is some element of randomness being used in your favorite all-skill competitive game. Counter-Strike, easy example, is well known for its static recoil patterns, and compensating for them is a clear skill differentiator. But when you naively jump into a match and spray all over the place while moving, that spread, the deviation from the static pattern, is random. Randomness is everywhere in games. It's what's happening in Counter-Strike's bullet spread, it's what's happening in Morrowind's dice rolls, it's what's happening in Destiny's perks, it's what's happening in Minecraft's world generation. Hey, wait a minute, this isn't Minecraft. It's Vintage Story. Nice. Even hardcore sims like iRacing will use randomness to simulate some things, because the underlying systems are so complicated and so impossible to mentally predict that it's simply easier to simulate them as a probability. When the system is tuned well, there's no real difference between getting a puncture from rolling dice versus getting one from simulating the strength of the bead on that particular bit of tire that struck the sausage curb. To the pedants, and I count myself among your ranks, I don't actually know how iRacing uses probabilities in that particular interaction off the top of my head. This is just an example. In computer science terms, any software that functions on probabilities is making use of random number generation of some description. I'll double back to that some description qualifier in a moment, CS Majors. Don't worry, I got you. In gamer lingo, anything that makes use of randomness is called RNG, often derisively. RNG just stands for random number generation or random number generator, as grammatically appropriate. Computers, though, are highly deterministic. That is, given the same inputs and instructions, a computer will always produce the same output. I am specifically ignoring processing errors that cause differences in output because that is about a billion times more pedantic than we need to be right now. It exists, don't worry about it, we are not veering off into those weeds. So, if a computer will always produce the same output, how do we get them to produce randomness in the first place? Random number generation has been an area of active study basically since the dawn of computing, because being able to generate random data is useful for more than just games. It is the very basis of modern cryptography, and a great deal of money and resources has been spent to produce a great many research papers on the subject. And you are, possibly without even knowing it, using cryptographic technology right now. Your computer is doing some form of random number generation to encrypt your internet traffic. I'm not explaining how encryption works, that's... We're too many tangents deep already. Broadly speaking, and this is where I'm going to annoy several CS majors, there are two methods of producing random data. One produces true randomness, and the other is pseudo-random, and is technically deterministic, though difficult to predict, and good enough for a lot of use cases. I'll break those two down. Truly random number generation is a fascinating field, mostly because the researchers working in it have thrown their hands up at the inadequacies of the thinking boxes we call computers. Their rigid logic and deterministic outcomes are simply too predictable. 
If an attacker can reasonably guess the inputs and knows the entire chain of algorithmic functions being performed on them, they can reliably figure out the output. Not great for securing passwords or your credit card, for example. For these kinds of high security applications, random numbers ultimately come from outside the computer. Typically, the source of the randomness is some physical process. Cloudflare has a wall of lava lamps in the lobby of their headquarters with a camera pointed at it. The camera's output is fed into a system that takes the constantly changing color data and produces a number to be fed into whatever software has need of it. Other methods I've heard of being used are atmospheric noise, background interstellar radiation, or even having a piece of radioactive material and using the timing, location, etc. of its decay as the source of your randomness. But requiring the average person to have a wall of lava lamps or a lump of radioactive material just to generate some kooky randomness for their video games is not really reasonable, or even practical. It's an awful lot of onus being placed on the end user, and actually true randomness can be a bad thing in some cases. Being able to both know the entire possibility space for your random values and being able to deterministically repeat them makes testing your software way easier. So for a lot of non-security purposes, such as all randomness in games, software engineers turn to pseudo-random number generation. And there's many different methods of doing this that have been developed over the years. Specifically in old games, it was very common for games to keep account of how many frames, or processor clock cycles, have occurred since the system was powered on or the game was launched, using this number as the seed for all random functions. As a practical example, Tetris on the NES uses a 16-bit Fibonacci linear feedback shift register as its pseudo-random number generator, and it runs every single frame. It's this. And I refuse to elaborate because the gritty details are not especially pertinent to the point of this video. This code generates a loop of 32,767 values and is deterministic, but the player's exact timing on when they drop a piece into place and a new one is generated is always different. So in a sense, it's actually the player's inputs that are the source of the randomness. It is theoretically possible to have all of your inputs for a specific game timed out to the frame, but no human can maintain that for very long. That's what a tool-assisted speedrun is, by the way. Again, too many tangents. Leave a comment if you'd like to see a video about tool-assisted speedruns, though. They're neat! In any case, let's move on to hash functions. I promise I'll relate all this back to Destiny 2, really. Hash functions are strings of math that take input and produce an output of a known size so it can be used in whatever. The values that go into a hash function can be anything. For the sake of argument, it could be the current frame count, plus the last button pressed, divided by the color of a specific pixel, or I don't know, whatever else the developers choose to plug into the thing. It's worth noting for future reference that hashing functions are completely deterministic, meaning that they are stable for any given seed value. The immediate benefit, for a use case of picking what perks a gun in Destiny will drop with, is that our game engine can have one generalized RNG function that spits out a huge number, and then we hash that output down into something that's more applicable to our specific use case. Let's look at FunnelWeb as an example. When rolling what will drop on this gun, we get a roll for the barrel, the magazine, perk slot 1, and perk slot 2. Each perk slot contains six potential perks that can be available, and the hashing function will basically take the large output from that master RNG formula and turn it into a number from 1 to 6, which is then used to select a perk. What I just said is simplified in a way that will probably annoy some people, so to appease those specific weirdos, parenthetical affectionate, what's most likely happening is that the weapon generation code is taking the remainder of dividing the PRNG output by the size of the array containing the valid perks and using that to index into set array. It probably looks like this pseudocode. I'm trying to talk to the sane non-programmers that are somehow still here, so please allow me this slight transgression of inaccuracy. Thank you. Like and subscribe for more defensive elaboration. This isn't where the problem comes from, though as this hashing does correctly result in even chances for any of the perks within a given slot to drop. However, players were noticing that certain perk combinations 
were not dropping as often as they should, while others felt grossly overrepresented. Destiny, it turns out, has one of, if not the, best API I've ever seen for a game, and technically inclined players are able to gather incredible amounts of information from querying it. There's a collection of websites that any player of Destiny 2 should be familiar with it, and one of them, Light.gg, decided to pull the perk combinations of every gun visible to them through the API and graph out the frequency of perk combinations. This is an older weapon, which doesn't express the bug. It's not a perfectly even spread, but that's because of players breaking down the roles they don't like. The distribution is still reasonably even, and this is what all guns should look like if everything is going well. Unfortunately, most of the guns that have been released more recently instead look like this. And this. That diagonal or even checkerboarded patterning is not natural and should not be happening. It was actually this community project that brought the issue to the attention of the developers. While there had been player complaints of unfair RNG for years, there was no intentional waiting in use, and the RNG code did output random enough values to be fit for purpose. Without data to back up the complaints as anything more than anecdotes describing runs of bad luck, Bungie didn't look into it any further. The work of Light.gg in bringing the data into the light was an instrumental step towards finding the problem and getting it addressed. So what went wrong. Yeah, I'm finally getting around to answering the question. Due to the variety of ways that loot comes into the player's possession in Destiny, sometimes that loot drops with more or fewer sockets into which things can be plugged. And in some cases, it's desirable for these sockets and plugs to be set by the developers, such as for store inventory that should be the same for all players. To handle this, one of the things that's included in the hashing function is the socket index. And herein lies the problem. Including this socket index means that the hashes for weapons were frequently generating as sequential values, resulting in unusual patterns of frequency for perk pairs. If you're a player of Destiny 2, belated welcome to the channel since you're probably new here, you can rest assured that this is already patched in the current version of the game. So how did they fix it? Pretty simple, actually. Rather than changing anything fundamental about their RNG or item generation code, they're just multiplying the hash by what they described as large prime numbers in a process called salting. While the sequential inputs still exist, this salting spreads them out by so much that the patterns seen before are effectively reduced back to noise. And for something you want to be random, being comparable to noise is a good thing. Salting of hash data is common practice for storing password records. Rather than storing them in plain text, responsible site owners will instead salt and hash the passwords they store. By doing so, even multiple instances of password123 will show up as different values in the database, making them more secure from each other when compromised, since each one would still need to be cracked individually despite being the same plain text password. And with that, Thank you for listening. This video is a bit of a departure from my usual retrospective stuff, but I think it fits with my game design analysis angle. I like games as a whole, and though I'm distinctly retro-leaning at this point, there's something to talk about with basically every game in my collection. So if you liked this, and you want to see more games from across the industry, not just Elder Scrolls on this channel, please like and leave a comment to let me know, and subscribe to see those videos when they go live. That'll let me know that this resonated with people and I should do more stuff like it. There's also a link to a Discord server and my blue sky in the description, if you're so inclined. But whatever the case may be, thank you very much for stopping by and lending me your ear. And, as always, have a great one.